Okay. Um, can you hear me? Is, is Mike on? Just want to check. It's okay. All right. So um, before I start my lecture, um, I mentioned this on Monday during the discussion hour, but I just want to publicly announce this again because some of you probably weren't there. Um, so. I know it's important and I encourage you to uh, try to get hold of me as much as you can. Um, and how do I actually make my office hour become available? So, so, uh, so far this quarter until now and maybe next couple of weeks at least, uh, I'm going to do a discussion hour myself on Monday. So you will be able to see me four times in this meeting. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, as well as uh, Monday afternoon. And then I have three hour uh, office hour uh, on Thursday. So I know that's not enough because we really have a lot of students. So uh, what I like to do is every hour after each of the meeting time, I'll be available. So, but, but the thing is, I don't want to walk back to my office. That, that itself will take 20 minutes away. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stay here. Uh, probably when I say here, I mean outside because uh, this classroom most likely will be used by some other faculty and students. Um, so if, if that still won't help you, please let me know Then I will arrange other time to be able to help, okay? All right. Okay, that, that's, that's just, so, um, Last lecture, I kind of went over the, the idea of a basic inheritance, single inheritance in C++, and with the syntax looks like this slide. This was the last slide I show on Monday. Um, Monday afternoon, I actually talk about homework assignment number two, but I realized uh, it's a lot of things to, to go through. So I kind of didn't have time to cover everything I want to cover about homework assignment number two. So today what I'm going to do is that I'm going to continue um, inheritance, especially single inheritance, and using the example of homework assignment number two as an example so I can actually explain the concept of transaction .h, which I, I kind of cover person .cpp, person .h very quickly. Even that I feel I did uh, convey all the information I like to do. But today I'm going to cover transaction .h and transaction .cpp and use that as an example to do inheritance. So, so just to clarify, homework sum number two does not require to use any inheritance. For homework three, you will start to use homework. You, you will be using both inheritance and the virtual uh, function. Both, both this concept will appear in homework assignment number three. Okay, so, so let's actually, we're, we're kind of already into homework assignment number two, which I, that will be a major topic for me to cover tomorrow. So the other thing I, I, I should actually ask you, do um, you think it, my help if we actually still have the Thursday um, office hour, three hours, or actually a little bit less than three hours in the, in the academic search, but at the same time, I actually use uh, Zoom to uh, broadcast. Would that be okay? Okay, because that room technically only can fit about 15 people at most. Um, so I'm going to make that three hours become Zoom 
uh, from the beginning to the end. So Zoom means that you can join at that time and you can ask questions. So it doesn't look live. Zoom, not like a recorded Yeah, it's live. Okay. It's, it's a live Zoom for that three hours. And so everybody, I mean, it's just make, make a good option for others who cannot come here on campus uh, be able to do. But, but just let you know in the protocol, uh, I, I, I sometimes uh, might not realize you have a question, so you, you try hard, okay? If, if I somehow I didn't get it, and just, just let me know, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure I get to you, okay? All right. Any other question? Yes, please. Yeah, the, the, the situation with TA, I, I just realized is that um, we actually think about where do we host the, uh, the office out. Traditionally, the TA was given a small cubicle and only one student can fit in. So I talked to the TA uh, last week. I said, why don't you use the same room that I did my office out? So they need, but, but that's not, not there. They are actually getting the key. So when, when they have the key, they will be able to, they, they probably will get the key to that. Yeah. They can do that as well. They can do that as well. Right. So, so, so let me tell you that I actually, uh, I see pro and cons about both using uh, Zoom and the in-person. Um, Sometimes in Zoom, we can help a large number of students. Um, but typically when I run it, I have to dynamically put people into different, uh, what we call break, break room uh, for them to kind of cluster. And my experience last year when I did this, it's, it's, a, it's a long waiting time for students because I need to go through like I have like eight different breakout rooms uh, and I cluster students there. Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's much harder for me. I, I personally rather for them to do the following, just like what I did, have an in-person, but also uh, live broadcast with Zoom. So that will help. Uh, that, that's what my thought. But if we want to have a one-on-one -on -one individual meeting, I think Zoom is fine, okay? So let's see how, how it works and the, the TA might decide, agree with what you suggest that maybe Zoom alone is, is actually a fair idea. Okay, any other question or issue? All right. Okay, so let me just recap what we did last time. We talked about a concept called um, inheritance in object-oriented. So essentially, we have a concept called base class and derived class. And derived class inherit every property and the member function from the base. And with the following, number one, syntax. Number two, the essence mode for um, the, the variable or member function in the base class. So in this case, this is the syntax. Uh, of course, if you're a base class, if you don't have any parent class to inherit from, then essentially you just did what, what you have done. It's just say class, uh, class name base, and whatever you can put it into three section, uh, private, protected, and the public. So previously, before we understand the concept of inheritance, we only have two keywords, private and public. And now we introduce a new keyword called protected. So protected basically say, um, the difference between protected and private is that if you put something in the private, then only this particular base class can access whatever you put in the section of uh, private. But with protected means that anything inside the protected that means all the derived class can actually access to that. So now you, you move essentially a private variable or attribute, you move that to protected, 
then essentially all the derived classes, the child classes, they get actually access to that. Okay, so that, that's that's the new thing, protected. And that's a keyword, private column, protected column, public column. That, that's number one related to the base class. And in the, in the um, derived class is actually a little bit different. Is essentially, um, you have to say the right class, uh, the, the, the name could be uh, anything you can find, but then that's the, that's the um, keyword, you have a colon, and then the first keyword is, is what we call a mode. The mode also has three options, public, protected, and private. And there is a, some difference also related to what can be accessed and what can be continued to push down on the class hierarchy, but the most uh, commonly used, okay? Basically, a lot of things in programming language is whether you understand the most commonly used cases well. You understand most commonly case well, and anything that's not so common, you actually check what exactly the meaning, semantic meaning or the implementation of that particular language. But, but I can tell you that it's pretty safe for you to learn inheritance. Don't worry about multiple inheritance right now until homework four. Don't worry about protected and private in that keyword after column. Just focus on public because you get that things working, get that thing clear, and the rest is just similar, just a little bit uh, semantic difference there. Okay, um, so you have that keyword, um, derived and public, and then the base, the class name on the base. And then that way you have everything on top. And the other thing you need to worry, as we mentioned, is constructor. So it means that, okay, I inherit everything, but when I create an object, I need to actually initialize, not just myself, but initialize the base or the parent because it's part of me. So therefore, um, you have to worry about how you're going to call constructor, destructor. It's not just only the sequence of the call, but also what parameter you might need to put in to invoke the, the parent class. Okay, so that, that's this figure really tell you everything about single inheritance. Any question? Okay, that's actually, I just want to give you a little bit theoretical about um, inheritance. This is nothing to do with programming language, which is, um, which is a more of a design concept. When you decide to use um, inheritance, you probably will touch this three question, not from the software engineering perspective, but more from the modeling perspective and what you really want to do. Um, the, the first question is that, well, the thing is that we are, the, the first question about model, remember I said object-oriented two, two view or, or two different perspective we need to respect. One is, of course, it helps, the software development process uh, it makes the code reuse a lot easier. It makes some of the spaghetti code into something which is more structured, more modular. That, that's a software development perspective. But more importantly, we talk about object-oriented is really try to help us to connect what we write as a program to the real world that we try to modeling after. And therefore, we always ask ourselves the question is that, well, you use inheritance, and inheritance is part of the model. It's actually model. You're, you're modeling my relationship with, say, a community member. I means I'm a teacher, and then what's my relationship with a UC Davis community member? That is an inheritance relationship. And your relationship is we're modeling a student and connect to the community as well, which means that what do we share as a common value, as a community member? You think about that, that is a modeling issue. 
whether that's a good modeling or it's a bad modeling. I mean, sometimes you, I will argue that I try to model community member of uh, UC Davis, like I show you the class hierarchy, it could be bad because essentially we're saying that we're expecting everybody is sharing that value that we define, we enforce at the top, which is called community member. So inheritance in some sense, you have to be careful that you don't put too much in, inside there because it unnaturally try to uniform a, a huge number of objects like a campus environment into some uniformity, uh, which has some negative consequence. So, so usually I will ask people to think about this before we go back to the more examples. The, the first question is that we should really ask, um, who are, I mean, who are you? You means an object, okay? I mean, person, object. Who are you really? Are you, are you really, this is the best way for you to capture yourself as a derived class or any, ba any base class in the chain to the root? Because you actually will be representing each one of them. Um, this is related to the second question is that, well, how do you want to be treated? How do you, how do you want people to ask to, to see you? I mean, for example, your student, your community member, under what situation do you want people to treat you like a student? Under what situation do you want people to treat you like a UC Davis community member? Okay, in object in the term, this means testing. Because if you are a pointer or reference to a student object, then you just casting, say, community, assuming we have a class of community member, you say community member star, and then before you put a pointer to you, and that will actually change the view. So people start to interact with you as a community member. So that, that is actually um, very important about how you can control how people see you at the different level of abstraction in the class hierarchy. That's a, that's a huge modeling issue. And can you also, uh, given that, then essentially each one of us has multiple views. If you think about that, how you orient it really in the modeling is actually because of the inheritance. It provide us the natural way of more than one view about ourselves. I mean, I, I, I usually don't, don't use this word to describe each one of you, but I sometimes use the following adjective to describe myself. That's that called a hypocrite. No, I'm just kidding, okay? Mean, meaning that, okay, I'm actually present to the student as a, as a uh, gentleman, as a nightman in the back. I'm actually very cold-blooded. I don't want to, you know, uh, I'm, I'm a, I, okay. This is the way people talk about professor. A professor we call a uh, pseudo extrovert. Have you heard about this term? You know the difference between introvert and extrovert? So usually I, I found that a lot of scientists were, were actually, uh, introvert, but we actually have to interact with students with the introvert. So I, I will say that is my option oriented like when I, when I become a professor in the room, I will be, uh, we, I have to be pseudo extrovert. But then when I'm actually lock in in the small room of my office, I'm working on my research, and then I change my view, okay? So that is interesting because in object oriented, you can think about when we model the real world. I mean, I was describing an example myself from the psychology perspective. And the thing is that how do I actually be able to model that into my program? And in fact, it's actually happening. The AI program that we're seeing every day, Facebook, Google, they're actually observing what you like, what you click, what you say, and try to actually model you as an object in your system about profiling, psychological profiling, and decide, for example, if you watch some of the movies, they actually use that to determine what kind of content they would like to recommend to you. And that's the trend. And whether that's right or wrong, that's a huge issue we need to debate. But 
essentially that's that's what the real world is and what the computer scientists try to model that's why those three questions in the inheritance really have a deep impact uh, today okay so that's enough about the concept to just let you know uh, so now i'm going to look at the transaction that's uh, this is a file i didn't cover um, Monday afternoon. So now I'm going to look at this uh, very quickly. No, not very quickly. I'm going to use the whole, all my time to talk about this. So I have a class called transaction. So, so let me actually tell you that the transaction, the idea is that I try to model the transaction as a general activity, most likely business social activity to a particular uh, person or to a bunch of person again. Okay, so that, that's that's a high level concept called transaction. So you can see that under transaction, I have multiple attributes I would like to describe that transaction. For example, uh, the first one is you know the transaction count, it's just uh, counting how many objects I have. So that that one is nothing to do with modeling. That one just a maintenance. But the second thing and uh, the variable, you can see that I have what we call transaction type, transaction description, transaction status, and also the transaction time. So essentially I'm talking about the general activity about what the activity is, what type of activity, do you have any simple description to capture that, and what's the current status? Has it been started or finished and things like that? And then of course, usually it has a concept called time to, for me to capture because transaction means it's important for me to know when did this happen, right? So it's a very general. That's the first part, the, the general part of the transaction. The second part is actually start to look into the person involved in the transaction as well as where it actually involved. So essentially you can see that I have a uh, TR agent. So basically say, okay, you have a transaction and who is actually managing this transaction, who owns this transaction? So I call it TR agent. It's just say there is a primary person that under this modeling is actually handled that. And also, we would like to say, well, when you actually handle this, where did you handle this? We'll sh show some example of why this is useful. I want to know where physically that this person is actually working on this transaction. Somebody come to this Google map and uh, make, a, make a mark on the Google map. Then we know where it's happened, when this happened, and also the, the GPS location, okay? And then I, I have an IP address. Uh, this, part is, this part is kind of not necessary for all type of transaction, but some of the transaction would like to know whether this is, uh, for example, this is somebody is from a uh, trust, trust uh, network address or untrusted network address, such as, you have the concept called VPN for access to uh, a lot of material on campus. And the reason we want to have a VPN is because now we can actually check whether the network address that this transaction is initiated is something that's actually uh, conforming the, the policy on campus. That's why uh, I always put the IP address there. Uh, right now, you don't have to worry about that. Yes. Oh, time t is a type. It's a it's, it's a type actually in C, not in C plus plus. And which which is, I think I have a sample code. We can take a look. I, I can explain to you later. Um, this is C plus plus, but I include a lot of C stuff as well. So so basically everything in C, I can include that. Later you will see that I actually find another class, a time class. A class time, but inside that class time, you use time t. Time t is essentially counting. Okay, let me just tell you. Time 
uh, five T is counting how many seconds since January 1st, 1970. So essentially, I'm using this time T as a, as, a, as, a, as a low integer to actually know how many seconds from that reference point. So I know what is the first time. So you have a bunch of library function. You will convert it, that number of seconds into year, days, and whatever, hour or something like that, months. Yeah. Okay. So time T is a type. It's essentially, I think it's a long int unsigned long integer M meaning that okay now i can give you a good example about why i use unsigned integer instead of uh, uh just regular integer so in the regular integer is going to be assuming 64 bit integer is going to be about something about minus two to the maybe 63 minus one, all the way to the biggest positive number is two to the 63, uh, something like that, with a 64 bit. But if it's unsigned, then that integer is represented by zero because unsigned means there is no negative. It's actually, everything is positive, start from zero, all the way to two to the 64 minus one. So essentially I'm saying if you use, you use an unsigned integer, you can represent a bigger, positive integer than sign. So that's why I want to represent the seconds. That's actually, I want to represent, I want to represent as a uh, unsigned. So I know how, what was, well, that's a good point. Minus means that you actually have time before that. Uh, I have to check whether time t, I think time t is unsigned. Yeah. It's an integer, essentially. It's just like uh, uh, the time you see I used earlier. Okay. so. There is the other part, which is uh, really interesting. How many of you have have looked at this uh, representation called voice sound? So some of you actually, not, not too many of you, you probably see character star, right? Character star means pointer to a uh, character or, or a, a flow star means pointer to the floating point or struck XYZ star means it's a pointer to a star. So essentially, pointer is just a memory address, and it's pointing at the data structure. But the pointer itself, you think about what's the address? Address is a 64-bit unsigned integer. It doesn't have time. The pointer itself doesn't have time. So sometimes it's very convenient for me to have a generic pointer. Means that I actually want to I, I want to have a placeholder. For pointer, but I actually don't know the type. So I use a voice star for that purpose. The so voice star use a lot for this situation. So we define something and we actually have an, I'm talking about this line here, voice star, TR data. So essentially you can find a voice star, but later when you use it, you know what you actually put it there. So you will use casting to cast the, the desired class or, or, or type to that pointer before you dereference the pointer. That's why it's a, it's a common uh, C, C++ convention to use a voice stop. It's just a generic pointer. Okay, so that's the protected area. And then I have a few, a few things. Uh, you can see that the first one is constructor. Okay, the constructor, because I need a lot of uh, data to, to actually assign all of them. So that's why you have pretty much everything that's actually in the private protected area and it actually being defined in the constructor. So this constructor is going to uh, handle everything. Okay, so let me see other things I want to talk about. Okay. I talk about set data, get data, just two function. For that pointer, I haven't talked about this. This is the first time you see this keyword virtual. I mean, this is, a, I only tell you how to declare that this is a virtual function. So this is a virtual function, but don't worry about that today. I'm not going to cover anything about virtual function at the moment, unless, well, until probably Friday, I will start talking about virtual function. Okay, 
Any question about the syntax before I look at the CDP, the transaction class CDP? Okay. So I'm going to look at the transaction and then I'm going to show you the inheritance for this one. But now I'm actually going to show you the transaction.cpp just very quickly. So this is the program that you actually receive. <clears throat> Okay, so transaction.cpp is nothing magic. Okay, it's just I have uh, some constructor. Okay, by the way, I show you on the slide doesn't have the first constructor. The first constructor only have argument type, and the second constructor is pretty much I actually put it there. Uh, it's just just um, setting the um, um, the initialize all the parameter. That's why it has argument type, uh, argument center, argument receiver, and everything else that's actually being fine in that transaction. By the way, the code I show you on the slide is a little bit different, but very similar to the code you receive. I think I add another extra person, which I will tell you why I actually did that uh, in, a, in a moment, okay? So that is a constructor. So essentially what you're doing here is just initialization. For constructor, there's nothing magic you need to worry about. It's just how do you actually do any initialization over there, okay? You see the difference? I just want to tell you, um, for this program, I just show you a slide. I already did initialization using bracket initialization. You, you will see the slide. I already used the uh, bracket initialization to do the, to do the um, initialization of the value. And then the body of the transact, the constructor is null. Nothing to be there because I actually already have the uh, bracket initialization. So essentially what you need to do for that particular constructor is essentially implement those lines of code that mimicking each of this bracket initialization. For example, uh, just pick a TR type. So what's TR type? You're going to say this to the TR type is equal to underscore TR type, underscore type, that's it. So it's essentially quite mechanical is that for each of the variable that you pass into the constructor, you need to assign that to a particular pigeonhole of this class design for that, okay? Okay, the, the next two is set data and uh, get data. They're basically the same. Again, it's, it's pigeonhole. So set and get is just try to avoid people directly access to the variable I try to protect, but I have two functions to allow people to use this two member function to access to that. So those two, in fact, is just one line. Pretty much each of this is only a few lines. In this particular case, set data and, uh, uh, and uh, get data, they were just one line. What that line is, is probably this to the TR underscore uh, data is equal to ARG data for the first case. And the second case is probably just a return uh, this to the underscore, uh, sorry, this to the TR underscore data. That's it. Just each of them should be one line, just, just set a variable or, or, or return the variable. Okay. Any question? Yes, please. Did I, did I ever tell you what's the syntax of this? Okay. I probably mentioned that to some of you during whatever time, but okay, good question. Thank you. So let me give you an example. Let me tell you that how I can do this, okay? 
So for example, I want to set, uh, let's, let's pick a one, say ARG type. So I can actually do TR ARG type. Is that right? Is equal to ARG type. Sorry, I'm, I, I think I have a typo. It's type underscore. Okay, so let, let's take a look. What is TR type? So here's the transaction. Under transaction, I have a TR type, right? So that's the attribute. So I can actually just say TR type is equal to um, ARG type. That, that's just an assignment to, to, to do that uh, bracket initialization. But sometimes when your program becomes big, this is sometimes confusing for the following reason. Because I actually, how do I know actually TR type? It's a it's a attribute belong to the class, so it's a local variable, or global variable, whatever. So essentially, if you're not even C plus plus programmer, in C programmer you should know there's something we call that naming convention. So naming convention is how do you name a particular variable? The most commonly uh, way to do that is uh, if you have a global variable, the first letter of the name should be capital. The rest should be lower things. It's a global variable. I'm just talking about one particular convention. If this is a macro, like if you define something, then all should be capital. So at least you know this is a macro, this is a global variable. So then you have like a local variable. Some of the local variables they started with underscore. But that could be confusing because compiler is also using that to represent some other information. So that's why you see that I actually put the TR in front. So the TR in front is just try to emphasize the concept that this is an attribute belong to the transaction class. That's just my convention to do that. But the other way of emphasize that is adding a this. So these two lines are actually exactly the same. This two line, they're exactly the same. So essentially this is represent the address of the first byte of the object we're talking about. So it's a pointer. This means that where is, where's me? Where is this particular object? So when you say this to the TR or any attribute that's clearly specified that is this object and for this attribute of this object. Okay, so that, that's what this syntax. And I use this a lot. Um, it's unnecessary, but it helps um, readability of my code. Okay, it's, it's just a convention. Yeah. Yeah. And there's like every single variable you pass in. So let's see, we have a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's an eight variable in that constructor transaction that CPP. So I expect you to have a line. Yes. Yeah. That's 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 what we want you to do. Yeah. Just initialize. Yeah. Okay. Any question? Okay. Let me get rid of this. So you know that the difference between these two, I'm going to. Okay, so we have a void. I will just give you another example. For here, my, uh, Answer to this is this TR data is equal to ARG data. Okay, just let you know another example how I'm going to use this. Okay, so the only thing that's actually going to be somewhat uh, interesting is get distance. 
Yes. You don't have to use this. It's just I don't. Uh, you don't have to use it. I don't require you to use it. It's just a suggestion that you can consider this option. Yes. It's just clarification. I mean, um, how do I say that? I mean, for many, a lot of things you have to think about when it, you are going to do this. A lot of people are going to do this. If if I'm going to read it for me, which I Sometimes I get this very quickly, like that. Okay, anywhere beyond 50 why I start to forget why I'm doing this. So I, I use a lot of over, uh, how do I say that? Um, adding a lot of stuff in here, not myself. But um, it's up to you. Really, it's up to your team. The team are working with us on this project. Okay. All right. So the the real interesting part is this get distance. The get distance is a, a function that's actually tell you that how I can get the distance for, if you look at the transaction, this is the transaction has two GPS location. One is uh, source, one is destination. See that? That's that those two lines. Those are the two GPS locations. One is source, one is destination. So essentially, the get distance is try to for you to compute the, the line distance between these two GPS locations. Okay, that, that's what this function is. So you can actually think about, oh, okay, for me to do this. Uh, that's that's not just an assignment. That's actually a real calculation. In fact, the program. If you take a look at the program I show you, you see that here. I actually call get distance. So what I did is I create a transaction object called flight. So I have a flight one, flight two, and flight three. Flight one is from Davis to New York, flight two is from New York to Sydney, Australia, and flight three is from Sydney, Australia back to Davis, assuming there is an airline, sorry, airport in Davis, okay? So we want to actually calculate the distance between each of the flights. So that's why this function, you see that that is a uh, um, output that's actually going to call fly one dot get distance. And I use the, the word to string, which help us to convert whatever numerical value, which is a double, that I actually convert that to a string format. And so I can nicely print that in, in that line. That's really the line doing. So now you're seeing. This is a driver, you don't need to write it. You're not supposed to modify. And then it will actually call the transaction docket distance to find out the distance between those two GPS locations. And then you are going to, the server is really going to test whether the answer you calculate is correct one or not. All right, just tell you a little bit of secret that if you look at the Location, the location is actually being defined on top. I actually define three GPS location. Um, uh, GPS DB is one of the uh, global positioning system format, which consists of two doubles to represent each of the point on Earth. Uh, so you can see that that's really the, the, the Davis location 38.5, uh, comma minus 121.7. That's the real location. And, and on Monday, I actually talk about the class GPSDD, which is in person.h and person.cpp, which I will show you in a bit. But essentially, now you can connect the dot is that the test program is going to call the transaction get distance. What transaction distance have is those sender, uh, sorry, source and destination GPS location. So now you need to write some amount of code. By the way, just give you a hint. The amount of code you need to write here is also very small. It's probably only one line. 
in my version, it's probably only one line of code because it will actually call the uh, the locate call the, uh, the distance function for the GPS DD. So let me just show you what GPS DD looks like. If you look at person .h, this is how GPS DD is defined. And you see that here you have a function is called distance. So distance is essentially uh, between the uh, between a two GPS location. One is the current object. And the other one is the uh, one is the source, one is destination. And then you can calculate. And I mentioned on Monday, how do you actually implement now this system that you actually copy the code from the? I already actually provide a, a like a URL under person.cpp. You can see that I have a distance. I have a distance, but the distance really called the uh, geo data distance, which is actually on top over here. And where do you get that uh, geo data source function? You actually go to this URL to get it. This is a, a piece of C code that you can include in this place and everything compiles to work. I always see and C plus plus there, they basically, um, you can compatible. Okay, you can do that. So that, that hopefully gives you some complexity. The amount of code you need to write is not a lot, but you need to copy the right thing, put the right code in the right position to make sure that everything works. I mean, it's, it's not a few lines of code, but the challenge is that you're dealing with four different classes over here. You have four different classes, you have a person, uh, class person, class transaction, class GPS DD, and the class IP address. So I make it simplified such as you don't need to worry about IP address. You only need to worry about GPS DD, person, as well as transaction, okay? Okay, any question? All right, now I can talk about inheritance. I have two minutes. I want to get started to talk about the, um, the inheritance idea using this. Give me two minutes, so we'll continue this on Friday. So what we have is this two class, person and the transaction. Those are the two primary class for your homework set number two. By the way, this will go all the way to future homework as well. So you, you see that I'm actually computing a essentially a transaction as a flight. This flight is flying from one location to the other. But the thing is that I actually realized that the transaction not only can have a flight, the flight of course and two GPS DD, but a lot of the time when I do transaction, I'm actually going to the same way. Or I go to a theater, or I go to a class, which I either have no GP, one GPS location or I have a different setting for amount of people that are involved in that transaction. So in some sense, I realized my transaction as I pass to you on homework assignment number two, is actually not very, very ideal for me to capture a lot of transactions. And it's also not natural because why a transaction need to have a source destination? It's a flaw. So what I did here is that I'm actually going to revise my transaction class. And I'm actually going to define a, the right class called flight. So essentially what I'm doing is that you can see here, now I'm going to make my transaction to be, be more, how do I say that, more concise, remove some of the information. And then I'm going to push that information into some other thing, such as the flight. So essentially I'm actually a 2P person. One person is called agent. Whatever issue the transaction or issue the airline ticket is going to be in transaction. So the thing is the passenger is going to be in uh, flight. So you can see what I have is a class flight. And 
and then have a column public transaction. And then essentially I have everything here that I want to put. This is just an example how you can potentially extend your definition. And eventually for homework three, I'm just tell you that, I mean, gradually I actually put a core object on top of that. Sometimes I grow down, but sometimes I actually grow up. I actually put the GPS location information on top of that because I realized everything has a GPS location. So therefore, I actually put both person and transaction has GPS location. Then I just basically try to push up in that sense. So eventually, this is actually just to let you know, this is your homework number three, it looks like this. So eventually I'm actually going to have more transactions, more classes, and for this way, you can see gradually, you feel that you start to get a class hierarchy like I showed you the other day, okay? All right, I'm going to stop here and I will continue uh, on Friday. If you have a question, please stay here. Okay, and, and we'll either go outside or whatever. Sure, just give me a second. Let me, uh, let me close the recording. The important thing I need to close the recording. <laughs>